Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. The National Park Service ended its first century in existence back in 2016. Since then, we've gone from concerns that the national park system was losing relevance with the general public to parks arguably being loved to death. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. For many, the Park Service is seen as an agency of friendly rangers tasked with helping them get the most out of their national park vacation. But the agency is much more complex than that. Indeed, it could be seen as one of the country's most science-focused agencies, as it deals with all sorts of ologies, as I like to put them. Biology, paleontology, archaeology, sociology, ecology, cetology, bioecology, and in light of the popularity of dark night skies, even planetology. With such a role in both the federal government and society, is the National Park Service living up to that role? Is it able to? To explore those questions, we're joined today by Michael Sukup and Gary Macklis, co-authors of a new book, American Covenant, National Parks, Their Promise, and Our Nation's Future. In a minute, we'll jump into that conversation. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Petrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. We're joined today by Michael Sukup and Gary Macklis, co-authors of a new book, American Covenant, National Parks, Their Promise, and Our Nation's Future. Welcome to The Traveler, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you've both had long careers with the National Park Service on the science side of the agency. Mike, uh, I believe you were a marine ecologist and served as a park researcher and regional office scientist and ultimately rose to the Park Service chief scientist. Your official title was Associate Director, Natural Resource Stewardship and Science. And Gary, you are a social scientist whose lifetime of research and teaching focused on national parks. Under John Jarvis, you served as the visiting social scientist for the National Park Service, and you also served as science advisor to Director Jarvis during the Obama administration. So in short, you're both deeply familiar with the National Park Service, its overall mission in general, and its science mission specifically. I guess that's pretty safe to say? I think so. Don't be modest. You guys have spent a lot of years in the trenches and uh, with, with science as your main mission. You've used your combined knowledge to, about the Park Service to write a new book, um, American Covenant, National Parks, Their Promise, and Our Nation's Future. Why did you write that book? Uh, we wrote the book because when we were in Washington together, uh, we had a whole range of experiences which I think are really important and I think need to be 
translated, transmitted, and and uh, and available to, to people. One of the things that I noticed over the years was a lot of good people with a lot of experience uh, gathered over decades. Once they walked out the door, the new people had a reset, started all over again, and that accumulated knowledge was was really lost, and it was quite valuable. Uh, sometimes you could you can tap that later on with uh, uh, retirees organizations or something like global parks or something like that. But by and large, there was a big and tremendous drain of experience, uh, hard won experience and some knowledge and maybe even some wisdom that came out of those years. And both Gary and I, I don't know how many years it is, 75 or 80 years, uh, felt that we should do something uh, to capitalize and, and, and make that available. So I, we spent a long time writing that book um, but I think it was worth it, at least from my perspective. Gary? Gary, why, why was there that drain of knowledge, that institutional knowledge? Well, I think partly it's human nature that each generation of leaders wants to establish their own identity. And part of it was the Park Service is extraordinarily good at telling stories to the public but not so good as telling in telling our stories to each other. We don't there there wasn't a lot of listening that went on among the different generations of Park Service folk. <clears throat> each generation <throat> thought the generations before it didn't do it quite right and now they were going to do it and then they made their mistakes and then the next generation did it. So I think what we wanted to do Kurt was tell some stories that revealed some bigger insights, not just for their own sake. And also we meant what we said when we said national parks, their promise on our nation's future. We truly felt that it was important to tell the tale of how national parks aren't just an outdoor recreation element in America, but critical to our future in so many ways. That's why we did it. That that institutional disconnect, if you will, is that part of the Park Service culture? Is it unique to the Park Service? Or do you see that through federal agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency? Well, a good example, I think we see it in all kinds of government agencies and not just the federal government. Look at NASA and look how the, acts, the Challenger accident taught them some things, but then not enough to prevent the next accident. So I think you could point to any federal agency and see that disconnect between generations. That's interesting. Well, and, and I would add to that, that you know, the mission of the Park Service is such a, a long-term protracted focused kind of uh, a requirement. What, what the Park Service is asked to do is something that, that requires a, a continuous you know, period of success, generation after generation. And how do you, how do you really make sure that that happens if with each new political administration and each new generation of employees, how do you make sure that the adherence to that covenant makes sense to each new generation and is required and is adhered to by each new generation of employees but also the public and Congress and um, everyone else. It's, it's a very difficult mission and it's really not something that the Park Service, because it's a federal agency, uh, is really geared for. And it, it could be improved and that was another reason to write the book. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've got an idea about that and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Has park policy been, been guided by science as much as it could be or should be. I mean, we can look back uh, most recently to 2012 and the uh, revisiting Leopold report, Resource Stewardship in the National Parks. That 23-page report um, that Director Jarvis requested um, was in a move, as I wrote at the time, to reinvent how the Park Service approaches scientific study and management of natural resources. The report casts the National Park Service as the agency that can best rescue, protect, and preserve America's natural resources. Has the Park Service lived up to the promise of that report? Uh, my observation from the, from the distance of retirement is that no, and in fact, it worries me that I see signs that, that 
uh, of the progress that has been made since the turn of the 20th century, some of that's being lost in, in uh, the Park Service is going back to its default mode of, of really focusing on the things that they're most comfortable with, which is visitor services and, and what it's been traditionally so successful at. Uh, Gary can tell you more about the implementation following that report. Gary? Kurt, I think revisiting Leopold had two roles. It was an aspirational document. Here's where you're going to try to get to, and you may not get to it, but that doesn't mean failure. It means you're attempting to strive, err, and strive again. But it also had some very specific things that could be done to advance science. And if you remember the political history, right before the end of the Obama administration, much of that report was converted into formal Park Service policy. An example requiring superintendents for the first time to demonstrate scientific literacy if you wanted to be a superintendent and a whole range of other science promoting policies. I don't know whether to be disappointed or prideful, but it was the first policy that Secretary of Interior Zinke under Trump rescinded without a word just rescinded it and got rid of it. That either suggests it was really important and they wanted it out of the way or that it was a sideline. I think a lot of that report and the ones that have come before, each one builds a layer of experience and wisdom that some of it still gets used. Is it? Have we achieved it? You're absolutely right, we haven't. Is that the main point? Not necessarily of any report. It's to guide you in the right direction. It's a navigational tool. It's not a port by itself. Now, I, I think it can be argued that the case of exploring and drilling for oil in Big Cypress National Preserve is an excellent case to apply the precautionary principle that the Park Service, at a minimum, should have required an environmental impact statement from the very beginning rather than an environmental assessment to to gauge the, the impacts of that work, if not simply reject the exploration and drilling request from the get-go. Is that a strong argument? I, I think that uh, because of the enabling legislation, there were so many compromises in that, and one of them was the, the allowance and the reservation of those uh, oil and gas deposits could go forward under the right conditions. Um, I don't know uh, the details of the assessment versus the environmental impact statement, but um, I don't think the Park Service has full latitude to, to uh, in any way do the last thing you said, and that's, that's totally disregard the enabling legislation that says that um, those resources are owned by, by other, other entities and, and, and available to them. So Big Cypress is a, a very big study in compromises, and I think that, uh, that's one of them, maybe, may, may not be the greatest. I, I believe, and, and maybe you, you or Gary have better um, recall, but I believe that enabling legislation also gave the Interior Secretary the authority to say, hey, this is going to be too damaging to the resources of Big Cypress, and so we're not going to let it go forward. I, th I think you may be right. I think there's that clause in there, but I don't know if there's been a secretary that's willing to, to exercise that authority. Kurt, you've raised a really interesting thing and something National Park Traveler could do of great service here. Lots of folk believe that the Organic Act and that the rules that surround the national parks are consistent across all the national park system. But of course, they're not. Each establishing organic act for a part has the potential to include these kinds of special conditions. And on reflection, I do not know of a source that would show for every unit what are the exceptions, the, 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 the customization of the organic act for that place that constrain or restrain our ability to manage. And whoever did that would cause a, would do a great service for conservation by having an index of all of Congress's mischief. Now, Gary, at the time that um, Revisiting Leopold came out, you told me that 
The precautionary principles described by this committee, the committee argues that the precautionary principle is necessary as a guiding principle at all levels of the Park Service, not just in Washington, D.C., but at the individual park level. Um, going back to the, the thought that superintendents should have a science background to become a superintendent, has that been practiced since the revisiting Leopold report came out, that, that superintendents at every level of the park system are living up to the precautionary principle? I don't think so. I think you can find almost any major principle of conservation, and among all the parks in the park system, it'll be patterned and and not systemic and universal. But again, the aspirational goal is to get them all moving in that direction. At any one point in time, you're not going to have that. By the way, in our book, one of the things that we tried to do is tell stories that were revealing of what happens when you don't have science. What, and if you remember Mike's description early on of how he got into the Park Service, you may want to talk, talk more, Mike, but it was all about a superintendent not aware of what science could do to help. And we tried to include those stories in the book to make the point that science is a tool, a requisite tool for superintendents. And, and maybe the larger point beyond that is that the Park Service, in order to be successful, has to be authoritative about what it is they're doing and what it is they're managing. And, and you know, uh, even Walmart has an inventory. You know, it, it's, it's very important that the Park Service not see itself as a caretaker, but more as an authority on uh, what's important to uh, consider when you're managing for long-term um, protection and also visitor access. You really have to know what you're doing in great detail um, in a very site-specific way. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a key point that relates to the idea that superintendents have to feel comfortable with accumulating that knowledge over the long term. It can't be one enlightened superintendent followed by one that's not. I mean, you have to have a long-term practice uh, and an accumulation over time of information and wisdom. If you're not doing that and you're a caretaker rotating in and out, I don't see how the, the mission can be achieved. Is, is the problem one of philosophy or funding? Mike, when you were associate director for natural resources and science, you once said that from a natural resources perspective, the National Park Service is an agency with a mission statement to die for and a budget that is killing us. <laughs> well, it's two things. One is that I don't think anyone in Washington really understands both the value and the, uh, the cost of a national park system. Well, we're running it on, in many ways, on vapors. But there's also a problem of once we get money, what do we do with it? And it's, it's often been the case, both Gary and I attended many, many meetings of the top leadership where resources were never on the agenda. Uh, everything else was, and especially visitor services and potholes and, and campgrounds and, and septic tanks and things like that. Um, that's so consuming. And if you layer on top of that, the political agendas that, that rotate in and out with the different administrations, Park Service is always uh, very much off balance. And, and if you looked at the budget, the budget reflected the priorities of, of that misbalance, in my, in my opinion. Um, Kurt, I, two things. First, what Mike and I tried to do during our time together in D.C. is convert the understanding that science was a cost to it was an investment. And to try to make clear that, like he said, you got to keep track of what you know, your inventory and what's happening, and that scientists were not a cost, they were an institutional bank of memory that needed to be nurtured. The other thing is that what the last four years have done in the Trump administration has taught us how attitudes towards science among Congress, among the public, can whipsaw back and forth, back and forth. 
I'm shocked at the amount of damage that was done, not so much that it was done, but how easy it was to do it. And so I think what we were trying to do in American Covenant is make the case that science and parks needs to be beyond partisan, not bipartisan, but even beyond partisan. And it needs to be treated as an investment in our nation's future, not a toy or a tool for political sides, either sides. We're talking today with uh, Gary Macklis and Mike Sukup, long-term uh, scientists with the National Park Service, um, now retired. They recently uh, co-authored a new book, American Covenant National Parks, Their Promise in Our Nation's Future. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Western National Parks Association is a nonprofit education partner of the National Park Service. WNPA supports parks across the West, developing products, services, and programs that enhance the visitor experience, understanding, and appreciation of national parks. Learn more at WNPA.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. You can see their successes at gtnpf.org. Did you know our partner, Interior Federal Credit Union, serves members nationwide and in the American territories? They are part of a cooperative credit union network with 5,600 shared branches and 56,000 totally free ATMs nationwide. Many of the ATMs are located in common places like 7-Elevens, gas stations, and CVS. Need to perform an in-person transaction? Not to worry. Use the locator tool on their homepage, interiorfcu.org, to find the closest branch to you. Go in, let the teller know that you're a member of Interior Federal Credit Union, and they can look up your account to help you with your questions. It's simple, easy, and convenient. We're, we're back now with Gary Macklis and, and Mike Sukup talking about their new book, American Covenant National Parks, Their Promise in Our Nation's Future. Gentlemen, you didn't pull any punches in this book. Um, in, in one section, you wrote that... Um, in many ways, the agency feels like a comfortable small family on a picnic that hasn't prepared for the storm clouds gathering on the horizon. Um, and then you also wrote, we have seen that the current system has grown without a consistent vision, plan, or systemic identification of sites necessary to become representative, resilient, and redundant. A representative system requires something of everything of value. Resilience requires adequate size of land parcels, and their healthy condition, and redundancy requires that we preserve more than one example of each type of ecosystem. How did, how did the Park Service get here after 100 years? It sounds like they're still trying to figure things out. I think that's true. I think they were so successful in the first 100 years. You ask about what was the old Park Service. It was a very proud and very successful agency. Around the turn of the century, I think it started to believe that that, that the old traditions were not working out so well. There's uh, storm clouds on the future in terms of, of all the different environmental uh, concerns that, that um, it really didn't become aware of until the last half of the 20th century. There was a wonderful report called State of the Parks Report that shocked the Park Service by saying that most of the real difficult long-term issues were outside the boundary and beyond the control of individual superintendents. 
Therefore, you had to be more engaged outside the boundary uh, and more uh, aware of, of what was happening, uh, both what were the natural variations, but also the human induced variations in the parks. And when did you have to act and when did you um, had to let the system um, equilibrate on its own? So I think the, the real point is that I don't think it's ever really gotten over uh, that, that early period of success when things were much more simple. At the turn of the century, around about, you know, when people were worried about Y2K and, and uh, you know, the, the next millennia seemed to be a little bit ominous, uh, Park Service leadership started to step up and say, uh, how, what do we have to do to be as successful in the future uh, as we were in the past? And so we put together programs to, to start to make um, a real solid foundation of information that superintendents could draw on. And that, that was the basis of the natural resource challenge. Um, it was a program, one of the first ones where, where we went to Congress and said, we need more science, we need more organizational focus on information gathering and analysis and understanding. Um, and Congress at that point said, wow, where have you been? Uh, this is the first time we've heard some of this. And, and we always assumed that you guys kind of knew what you're doing. Uh, and there were some pretty good indicators uh, in court systems and public arenas where we were kind of caught uh, out of, off base, not knowing what we were doing. So um, around the turn of the century, I, I think the old park service started to evolve into hopefully the new park service, which, which is much more information based, much more science based and much more bigger picture focus than, than it had been in, in the old Park Service. Well, one of the fun things about doing a book with two old curmudgeons is we <laughs> don't have to agree. <laughs> and I tend to be more cynical and Mike tends to be more optimistic and that's a good mix. I don't think there ever was a golden era of the National Park Service that, um, remember, we drove out indigenous peoples. It was a deeply sexist organization. We piled up garbage in parks so bears would come and people would sit on grandstands to watch the bears paw through garbage. There was plenty that evolved from the Park Service. So rather than, my view is, and I apologize for bringing in Goethe, the German, artist and scientist, but in Faust, his classic play, he speaks about strive, err, and strive again. And I've always been fascinated that Goethe, 200 years ago, understood adaptive management really well. And I think it's enough for the Park Service to strive, err, and strive again, and that that's what's most important. But I think Looking back at the history of the Park Service, there's all these good things, but there's a dark side to it, too. Yeah. Has the dual mandate given the Park Service kind of um, been crippling in a fashion? Um, on, on one hand, you know, we're, we're supposed to protect these resources for future generations enjoyment. And on the other hand, we're supposed to protect the resources. And um, some would say that um, that's getting out of balance. Well, that was a big push, I think, by the, the Bush administration. They felt that the balance had shifted too far towards protection. And yeah, they've tried, I, I, you're probably aware of the, the uh, attempt that they made to change the management policies. I think the Park Service has, has been told by Congress a number of times that, that there is a hierarchy within that mission. And I think, you know, some of the outside scholars like Robin Winks, I think, looked at it. And a lot of people have come to the conclusion that without protection first, there's, there's a declining function for recreation. People come to see resources that are intact and fresh and, and vital and, and not worn and beaten and things missing and things like that. I think there's a, there's a real hierarchy in the mission that allows for the, the uh, access and recreation uh, as a very important element, but a, a secondary element to uh, keeping things uh, really intact and, and, and healthy as, as natural systems. That first part, keeping systems healthy and natural, uh, is a tremendously challenging intellectual um, effort. 
and it takes an awful lot of thinking and a lot of uh, continuous mass um, success and practice. I might add to what Gary just said and in, in, uh, why I think it used to be uh, a, a golden age for the Park Service was when I first joined the Park Service, I was amazed at, at how popular the Park Service is. I mean, it's done a lot of crazy things, uh, but it grew up in the same era as ecology itself, was, was, as a science was growing up. So some of these er early errors and all, all of that, I think, are, are quite understandable. But the overall result and the system as, as hodgepodge as it has been built uh, is a system that, that has gained America's respect in, in the Park Service. Uh, if, you, if you were on a flight and you had a lapel pin that had a National Park Service arrowhead on it, people would come up to you and, and really like you uh, for, for no apparent reason other than you're associated with national parks. And I think the National Park Service, because it is the embodiment of the national park system is very, very popular. Voted generally number one um, in whatever polls, but one or one, one or two, depending on whether the Postal Service advertises at the Super Bowl, I think is the, the factor that might kick it out of the number one slot. But I think there was a period of success and, and I think it started to fall apart when uh, some of the major resource issues like bison being shot and like elk being culled and, and those kinds of major issues I think we're, we're, we're sort of the beginning of the unpinning of this idea that the ranger in, on the white horse in, 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 the, in the neat hat uh, was enough. And that's what the book is about is, you know, it's really got to, to, to build on that tradition, but build in ways that make it uh, ready for the next millennia. Gary, any additional thoughts? I've always been fascinated, Kurt, that in the organic act, and it says provide for the enjoyment, it didn't say provide for every imaginable enjoyment, including bars, casinos, ski lifts, sleds, all this stuff. And, and that means, in my opinion, that the organic act is organically connected. You protect you protect unimpaired to provide for a unique kind of enjoyment that then helps support through public advocacy that protect unimpaired, that the two go together. In the book, Mike, tell, Mike wrote a story, maybe you could quickly tell it, Mike, about <clears throat> Director Kennedy at a hearing who did a good job of explaining that idea about enjoyment. It's in the book and it's very funny. Yeah, I, I would just mention it briefly. Uh, there was so much hostility in, in Congress uh, during Roger Kennedy's uh, term as director. And there were hostile uh, uh, sessions on the Hill where he was invited to, to uh, testify. I, I can't remember under oath or not, but he was invited to testify. And one of them, one of the first ones, he showed up and the first question was, uh, Mr. Kennedy, uh, would you uh, explain the Park Service's view of, of recreation? And these were people who were excited about bringing in some more snowmobiles and more ATVs and, and, and mechanized uh, uh, recreation and those kinds of things, uh, jet skis and all of that. And Roger in his stentatorial voice said, recreation, in National Park is informed delight, not feckless merriment. And the questioner wasn't sure what that meant, I don't think. You know, he was whispering with his staff, uh, are we for feckless merriment? And where do snowmobiles fit in? You know, that kind of thing. And because, because he was um, so certain about it, they quickly adjourned and felt maybe Maybe everything was okay, but I don't think they understood what he said. No, I think that's a, a long-standing problem um, with the park system is uh, everybody wants to be able to do what they want to do in the parks, and it's not always appropriate, um, for sure. We've seen that with, with e-bikes and um, the motorized recreation. I mean, there's a place for everything. It, it's got to be... On one hand, it's got to be a very exciting time to, to be a scientist in the national park system. I mean, we've got climate change spreading around the world, touching every every unit of the park system. And we need science to examine exactly what is happening and, and how to mitigate it, if possible, or, or how to adapt to it. 
Is that is that a fair statement? I think not only is it fair, it's absolutely essential. The COVID-19 pandemic is an example of why you need science in the national parks. And I know that sounds strange, but COVID-19 has had a wide range of ecosystem impacts and they can be measured. Think of it, Kurt, we've lost during the pandemic an entire decade of reduction of plastic waste and its impact on oceans, on beaches, et cetera, because we went back to individual packaging. A huge impact on our progress as a sustainable society. At the same time, at the same time, there were places now devoid of people during the pandemic where animals thrived. So if you don't have science, you don't know what's happening under these emergencies, let alone the chronic kinds of disasters. Look at wildfire in California right now. Because of decadal drought, climate change, altered hydrological regimes and forest practices all in different amounts, we have the potential for a disastrous fire season after a disastrous fire season. And right now it's science, forest fire science that will help us prepare for it. Without science, we're flying blind. So where does the Park Service go from here? Can it, can it write itself? What, what needs to be done? I, I wonder about that because I'm not sure left to its own devices, the Park Service can. It's hard, it's hard to know how it's going to uh, deal with Congress and deal with these new administrations. And I don't know what shape the organization is in. One of the things that bothers me is when I came in in, in the early, in the mid seventies, they sent me to a six week course uh, to understand the mission of the Park Service. And it was a course at the Albright Training Center in, in Grand Canyon. And in six weeks, we heard all of the stories, both plus um, positive ones and negative ones. And um, people in the course got to go with protection rangers on patrol and things like that. So you've got a real good sense of the agency, of the culture of the agency, of the legal backgrounds, uh, experiences, successes, defeats. Uh, all of that was inculcated in new employees. That doesn't happen anymore. And the new employees are... Uh, being brought in from all over different agencies and, and, and they're coming in fresh and new, uh, but they're not really getting much of a sense of, of what I think is important. And that's the, the, the history of the uh, and, and culture of the organization, um, where it's been and where it should go. The first thing, Kurt, is it would be a step forward to actually have a national park director. <laughs> I remember... I worked for Jarvis. He remains the last National Park Service director. It would be nice to change that. A second thing, and we make this point in the book, is there needs to be serious consideration to making the Park Service an independent agency outside of the Department of Interior, like other agents, like the Smithsonian and others. You're, you're so reading my notes. You're reading my notes, tool. Gary. Pardon me? You're reading my notes. That and, was my next point. And so, um, and there needs to be a serious discussion of that at a bipartisan level. And the third that I would argue is that the generation of leaders that was whipsawed between the Obama administration and the Trump administration back and forth, we need a period of calm and reflection. <laughs> prudence and restraint. Yes, we've got some things we have to fix, but if we continue each administration just whipsawing at the Park Service back and forth, I don't think anyone is well served. So how do we get that bipartisan support to, to break the Park Service out of the Interior Department and and set it up similar to the Smithsonian Institution with a board of regents and, and hopefully a, a director that spans um, presidential terms, you know, like a, a six-year term or, or something like that. Because it is whipsawed. I mean, we've really clearly seen that in the past eight years. I think it's always off balance. And I think that that's 
totally incompatible with, with the mission, which calls for balance and long-term focus and, and, and success. So yeah, I would agree. I think the, the best thing that, that I could come up with is the idea of more exposure. I think when people learn about the park system and how important it is, what it could be doing, what it has been doing uh, successfully, but what it needs to do to be successful in the future and all the different things it could be doing um, uh, in terms of education and, and uh, understanding of, of climate change and everything else that's going on. I think the park service can be a much bigger player in the landscape uh, and, and have lot, lots more visibility. And that visibility, if it's combined with education, can maybe get people to speak out and someday we'll have uh, an agency that's not hidden in interior and both uh, politically and, and budget wise, but stands alone and neither continues to uh, garner the public support that it has now or, or uh, is so visible that it, it's fixed so that it, it can be successful. I think steps toward that, number one, would be ensuring that a Secretary of Interior is appointed who is willing to consider giving up an agency. That's extraordinary, but it's necessary. The second would be the conservation community to advance beyond their own parochial self-interest. I want it to stay here because we can do better that way and instead see what's best for the future of the country and the National Park Service. And third is probably some high visible event like what Mike described, some conservation summit where the agenda included a serious discussion about the separation of the Park Service from Interior, because it would be that visible summit that would get people scratching their heads saying, well, why not? Why? That might work, that might work. And until we do those three things, it's, it's a great idea that isn't here yet. Is it a feasible idea in today's political world? I mean, Bipartisanship seems to be dead for the most part in Congress. The national parks seem to be an afterthought. I mean, supposedly there's a, a national parks caucus in Congress, and um, they don't seem to be rising to the, uh, the needs of the park system. I think, Kurt, like I said earlier, we need a period of calm, prudence, and restraint. And it may be the next four years, maybe it may be the next eight years that we need a period to rebuild the Park Service expertise, rebuild its sense of purpose, rebuild its science capacity, and prepare the ground for a transformative change. I don't think it's possible right now, but then again, there were lots of people who didn't think establishing the National Park Service in 1916 was possible. <laughs> If you don't strive, you don't err, you don't strive, you'll never get anywhere. Wayne Gretzky, the famous philosopher, hockey player, if you don't shoot, you can't score. And I would let me let me add another point. Uh, there's very few things that I that I see Congress agreeing on right now. And maybe even the American public is not agreeing on a lot of things. But most people can see some value in protecting our national heritage and the, and the things that really made us a great country and continue to make us a great country. Um, I mean, we are so blessed with our uh, natural heritage that it's worth protecting. I think people can coalesce around that. Maybe that's the one thing right now that could lead to some kind of um, uh, comedy in, in Congress. One, one can only hope, and in speaking as the optimist here, I really would like to see that happen. And I think maybe it's, it's just one area where it could possibly happen, who knows? But I think it's so important uh, that it do happen because there's so much at stake. It does maybe happen. they'll all read our book, Kurt. Yeah, that, that would be good. Once they listen to the podcast, absolutely. Sales will go off the charts. <laughs> now to accomplish that, uh, I mean, yeah, we need a period of calm and, and, and prudence. We also need a National Park Service director that can carry that mission forward, correct? And and here it is. Here it is. The end of May. Um, we haven't seen any nominees for Park Service director come forward yet. Um, do you gentlemen have any insights to 
A, why there's been that delay, and B, who might be under consideration and whether they have the um, the metal to, to carry that mission forward as you describe it? None whatsoever from me. None. This I, is I an unusual. You're... It's an un, sorry, Mike. It's unusual period because usually, when there's a transition to a new director, the rumor mills consist of two rum, rumors: rumors of merit, where people are being considered, and self-declared rumors, people who want to be director who create rumors that they're in the hunt. <laughs> and I've heard neither rumors of merit or self-directed rumors. I can think of one or two good candidates in in in, in the ranks, but by and large, I, I've lost track of, of who's there. But uh, I think if you can find an exceptional leader within the Park Service, that, that often makes a lot of sense, especially if you want a period of calm. Because when a political appo appointee comes in, uh, it takes them a while to figure out what's going on. And then uh, the administrations change very quickly. So I think it's really important that that be really well thought out and not based on the fact that in some cases it's seen as a political plum that you can give to a, a, a donor or a supporter, early supporter in your campaign, that kind of thing. Uh, it's listed, I think, in that book or used to be uh, the book of uh, political plums that a new, new, advice, new president can give out. It shouldn't be thought of as that. It really needs uh, a period of calm with really seasoned uh, and, and forward-looking leadership. Does it have to be somebody from within the Park Service? Don't think it has to, but um, uh, because it's so unsettled at the moment, it probably would be my preference. I think, but a really, a really good, a really good visionary would would be a good thing right now, for wherever it comes from. I would agree with Mike. It it's a question of merit, not heritage. So you, you wouldn't restrict it to Park Service personnel, just throw the search wide open. Well, right. not wide open. I would yeah. avoid Hollywood celebrities and <laughs> and stakeholders. And stakeholders. Gentlemen, it's been a great conversation, very provocative, um, definitely food for thought, um, at least for me, and I'm sure our audience will find it interesting. Where can where can folks buy your book? It's on Amazon, I know, and it's also at Barnes and Noble. And they can get it direct from Yale University Press. Ah, good. Okay. We've been talking today with Gary Macklis and Mike Sukup, authors of a new book, American Covenant, National Parks, Their Promise, and Our Nation's Future. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, Kurt. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. As always, let us know if you have any suggestions for future podcasts. You can reach us with your ideas at news at nationalparkstraveler.org. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.